be a voracious learner that is ask questions, but most importantly, seek out information that is beyond your business, beyond your topics that you're dealing with today. Welcome to the Hydric and Struggles Leadership Podcast. Hi, I'm Larissa Toplanitsky, a partner in Hydric and Struggles Toronto office and leader in the firm's CEO and board practice, where I work with boards and CEOs to optimize their performance. As an organizational psychologist, I've spent my career studying and working with exceptional leaders, and I'm always keen to learn ways to unlock their potential and enhance their impact. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Maura O'Neill and discuss the topic of narrow-mindedness. Maura is an award-winning faculty with the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley and their executive education program. There, she teaches and does research on new ventures, innovation, and executive leadership. Prior to Berkeley, Maura served as a chief of staff in the Senate during the 2008 financial crisis and was appointed by President Obama to be the first chief innovation officer at the U.S. Agency for International Development, responsible for driving outcomes globally. Maura has also founded four companies in the fields of electricity efficiency, smart grid and customer info systems and billings, e-commerce and digital education. She has a PhD from the University of Washington and two MBAs, one from Columbia and the other from University of California, Berkeley. Maura, I'm thrilled to be here with you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm excited to be with you and the audience as well. Maura, to kick off this conversation, given the work you and I do with CEOs, I'm curious about how you see CEOs being vulnerable to narrow-mindedness. Well, I think that anybody who gets to the position of CEO has to juggle lots of things. But one of the most important things a CEO does of a startup company or a globally important company is they make choices on what to focus on. And there's a lot of pressures that push all of us in the direction of narrow-mindedness. For CEOs, if it's a publicly traded company, it's making sure that they're delivering on the expectations of the analysts and the investors. So there's a short-term focus that's absolutely essential. They have to meet the numbers. At the end of the day, sales on profits drive everything. And so they just end up, it's like a centrifugal force that is pulling the CEO, even though they want to rise above it and spend more time looking at the big picture. There's this centrifugal force that's pulling them to be narrow-minded, on the day-to-day deliverables. And Lord knows in this day and age, the world is changing every moment of every day. And so it doesn't really give them a lot of time to sort of catch their breath. Thanks. To follow up on this, what are your high-level views on narrow-mindedness and how does it apply to C-suite executives and board members? So, you know, Larissa, we always think that narrow-mindedness is somebody else. It's the person at the other company or the person on my board that has a different point of view or the person that watches a different TV news station than I. And I'm here to tell you that we're actually all narrow-minded and that we shouldn't think of it primarily as a bad thing. We should think about it as a good thing but there's ways in which it fails. So here's some of the history of it. When we pop out of the womb of our mother, we are hardwired to be narrow-minded. I have to decide immediately, Larissa, whether you're going to kill me or whether you're going to be a friend. And so that stays with us all our life. The good news about it is it allows fast and frugal decision-making. It allows us to be able to really make decisions with bits of information that we pattern recognize. It allows operational excellence. We wouldn't have globally important companies if we didn't have repeatable processes. As I say, I don't want the pilot flying me from Seattle to the Bay Area to innovate on the fly. Having said that, the flip side of it is That causes us to be narrow-minded, that fast and frugal, that operationally excellent, and we can make spectacular errors. We can just miss whole changes in the marketplace 
or we sort of kick the can down the street. We think, oh, this dragon isn't going to eat our business today. Maybe on the next CEO's time they will, but otherwise I have a lot of pressure just to deliver. So I think Silicon Valley and its equivalents wouldn't exist if CEOs were not vulnerable as all of us are to narrow-mindedness. So what I like to say is, say thank you to the narrow-mindedness that you use because it allows us to do a lot of things very well again and again. But it can result in spectacular errors. And so we've got to learn to overcome it. And we've got to teach our body and our brain and our organizations to overcome our natural narrow-mindedness. My mind is racing from my academic background around all the social biases and the shortcuts, as you said, and the tricks to actually get around that and how to be effective knowing all these. So beyond actually now knowing more as you did is the roots of this and the benefits and where the traps are, what counsel would you give to CEOs and boards of how do you actually balance those? So specifically, how do you balance the benefits of these things with not getting trapped in them to keep broad and benefit from the breadth of thinking. So I think the first thing to do is that you've got to program this time to combat your narrow-mindedness, either as a board member or as a CEO, quite deliberately. It doesn't just sort of happen at 11 o'clock at night, five minutes before you're thinking about going to sleep. So look at your calendar and say, how much of the time am I spending being a voracious learner? Understand the geopolitical concerns that my company is operating in understanding much more deeply the competitive pressures of my customers because my customers are going to ask for things or have opportunities for me to provide many more products and services if I understood what their business is and what they were doing. So at the global level, to understand what's happening at the more specific level, understanding what's happening in our customer base and how that's changing. And to do it quite deliberately, to put time on their calendar, you know, call it study time, call it, and just I block out a chunk of my morning. I'm not always successful, but I'm successful enough to say, this is super important. You don't run a marathon and then all of a sudden expect to be brilliant in terms of those out of the box ideas. So I'd say the first thing is schedule it. The second thing is be a voracious learner. So learn geopolitical stuff, learn your customers' demands, learn other fields. AI is going to really disrupt as internet did. So don't leave that to your technologists if you're the CEO or board member. Invite an expert in to coach you and to help you upskill on AI. So whatever the other issues are that are coming forward. Thank you. I love those pragmatic tips. On the same theme of pragmatic tips, I'm thinking about our work with directors and who by design now for best practice, we're picking people with diverse backgrounds and skills and interests. And they're all highly intelligent and accomplished. And so with the assumption that they've come from data and breadth to have a point of view, some with that point of view, might appear or come across as more narrow-minded. So my question to you is, in dealing with people who might come out of the gate feeling or chatting in a more narrow-minded way because they said, I've done the research, I have experience, you can't persuade me, what counsel would you give people to try to open that aperture to have the discussion that's broader and even to persuade them? So let me unpack that, but let me set the context. So if you want to break your own narrow-mindedness and be the innovators in business and in society that we admire that are so iconic, you need to do three things. The first I just talked about, which is become a voracious learner, just really, and study outside your field. I'm a voracious reader of business biographies of all different fields because I think they have a lot to teach me. 
The second thing is question the status quo. We often think if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But as CEOs and boards, actually, that's the most vulnerable time is when we think everything is going well and we don't need to worry about it. So question the status quo. We can go back to that in a second. There's a third one as you brought up, which is to embrace diversity and dissent. And in this case, I actually mean the emphasis is on dissent. So it turns out that that board member that has a different point of view may actually be driving you crazy. In fact, should be your friend. Because what we find is that if one person in a group has a different point of view, even in dissents, even if they are wrong, The group decision is better and more nuanced. And here's the kicker. You can't play devil's advocate. You can't sort of say, I'll pretend I have that point of view. That's why it's such a powerful best practices of boards to actually have a diverse group. So if you have somebody like that, that you're struggling to understand, you think they're narrow-minded, first of all, ask yourself in what ways are you narrow-minded? But the second is, ask them to give you a couple books that they think you should read. Not sort of the bestseller books, but things that they think would help you understand their best experience or articles. Spend time with them. Go to lunch. Go to dinner one-on-one and really understand because the fact of the matter is they have so much to teach us that we don't know. I remember when I went into a presidential administration, I went for the first four months into the Department of Agriculture. And I said, I don't know anything about agriculture. Why are you thinking that I should go in at the top level? And they said, we have 100,000 people that know about agriculture. There's not many people who know what you know. And, you know, in four months, I completely redid the biofuel strategy for the country across all the federal government. It's just because you want people to think differently because they will help you with your blind spots spot. And we all have them. And also look at the business and see where there's opportunities. I mean, I think it's very interesting to watch how some of the iconic innovators have done it. So everybody looks at Amazon and it wasn't obvious if you were selling books or mops to actually become a cloud business with AWS. And yet what they saw is we have this huge need. I'm sure other people have this huge need. And so how do we offer this? How do we make this a profit center rather than just a cost center on our balance sheet? So that's one way directors and boards can look at the hidden opportunities because of their scale, because of how they operate in their supply chain. What other value-added products and services could they provide? And somebody who thinks differently than you and I is going to be the best person to think about how you approach a different product or how you offer a service that you haven't purposely offered. So I say, rather than roll your eyes when that person opens their mouth or goes into the room, do just the opposite. Say, they have something to teach me and I'm here to learn. And with that, I like the expression, be curious. Help me understand why you feel that way. Uh, And and I'll learn a lot and be open. Have an open aperture. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I was in a meeting last week. Somebody said, I think that scale and impact are two different ends of the spectrum. And I thought, well, how can you have impact if you don't scale? And so rather than think to myself, oh, you're an idiot or you're not going to pull this off, I did that exact thing. I said, unpack that for me. Why do you think that impact and scaling are two ends of the spectrum. So I think you're absolutely right. Ask more questions, dig deeper, and you'll find that you'll learn something that is absolutely essential to your decision making. The other way you can do it is we all like to get along with each other. And we often, particularly in boards, it becomes the norm to sort of go along to get along. And we've, of course, seen some spectacular errors in board governance when that's happened. But the issue is, how do you sort of do do that? And I'll give you an example of one of the President of the United States Chief of Staff. He always started the meeting not asking, where do we agree? He started the meeting by saying, where do we disagree? 
so that we could really understand that rather than we talk about the comfortable things. We talk about what we agree. And in the last five minutes, somebody gets the courage or finally says, I disagree. And we've wasted all this time just sort of being buddies on this issue. So I think that's a practical tip is think about when you have really tough issues, can you open with where are points of disagreement rather than our points of consensus? So Maura, I'm doing a mental tally of all of these wonderful practical tips that you've shared and the color around them. As we wrap up this podcast, I would love for you to do the speed round, if you will, of whether it's your top three practical tips or if you even have five, I will keep you to it. Just to summarize for us, the pragmatic tips you have for our audience. The pragmatic tips are first be a voracious learner, that is ask questions, but most importantly, seek out information that is beyond your business, beyond your topics that you're dealing with today, but most certainly the topics that potentially like AI at the moment have the biggest impact or could be on your business. So be a voracious learner. Two, question the status quo. Andy Grove, who was an iconic CEO of Intel, once said, only the paranoid survive. And he said, if you don't cannibalize your margins, somebody else will. So rather than sort of celebrate these amazing margins, think about how you can continue to disrupt your own business before somebody else disrupts it. So that's question the status quo. And then the third one is embrace diversity and dissent. So really have that as a norm of your board meetings, of your C-suite, of the corporation. That doesn't have to be nasty. We don't have to tear each other's eyes out. We don't have to be mean. We can be kind in it, but we can create a culture where different points of view, even dissent, is valued. And I can assure you, you're going to have a more profitable, happier, and more trusting corporate environment in which to thrive. Thank you, Maura, for your wisdom and your pragmatic tips. I personally could spend all afternoon speaking with you, but I know neither of us have that time and certainly our audience doesn't. So thank you for making this meaningful and insightful. Thank you. And I think the job of the CEOs and board members and people who are aspiring have awesomely challenging jobs. So I hope that I've added a little wisdom and made it a little easier today with some of these tips. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining Hydric and Struggles Leadership Podcast Series. 